uh, zijn uh, uh, van degene met wie hij het meeste contact heeft, of uh, ziet in wat uh, zij uh, als secretariaat of in de hoogleraren, mm-hmm. waar hij onder valt, uh, zeg maar, en mm-hmm. ik uh, iets wat moet zeggen. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Mohamed Hussein will defend his academic thesis evidence on hospital accreditation to leverage its prospects for improvement, the case of Saudi Arabia. I welcome you and wish you lots of success, of course, supported by your paranyms. And I also welcome, of course, your supervisors, Professor Groot and Professor Pavlova, and of course, the members of the opposition and the audience here and the audience online. But before we start the opposition, I give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit what your, the content is of your thesis. Okay. <clears throat> dear Prorector, um, dear member of Corona, um, audience, family, and uh, friends, in 15 minutes, uh, I'll present summary of my uh, dissertation titled Evidence on Hospital Accreditation to Leverage its Prospects for Improvement, the Case of Saudi Arabia. Initially, uh, in, in the background, uh, internationally, countries take measures to enhance the quality of service. Uh, ev- evaluation of the quality of service is, is essential. And this evaluation will be internally and externally. Accreditation is being known as an oldest and the most frequent known external evaluation techniques. Evaluation by accreditation, it goes with a process assessing the performance against recognized, predefined standards. Typically, accreditation was introduced initially as a voluntary process. Subsequently, as it's seen here, accreditation scope, it goes with, with different modalities and different scopes from overall organization to su- specialty, subspecialty, or disease. It's no longer voluntary. It could be voluntary, uh, uh, mandatory. It goes with some uh, governmental entities, non-governmental entities, and the seeds of accreditation was planted around a century ago, and we are seeing the accreditation flourishing internationally. Up until today, we are talking about more than 90 countries adopted accreditation as a strategy of improvement. Nevertheless, in the context of Saudi Arabia, 
the, still there is a question of the accreditation impact, challenges, enabler, with a limited studies discussing these uh, concern. Subsequently, we have this dissertation to cover these four objectives. Objective number one is to investigate the impact of hospital accreditation, and we use a systematic review for that. The second objective is to explore the attitude of hospital directors toward accreditation, and we have done a qualitative study for that. The third objective is to examine the perceived driving and restraining factors at a wider scale from the perspective of hospital directors as well as quality director. And in this study, and to meet this objective, we used, again, a qualitative study. And the last study was to close the loop with some recommendations to, um, to understand what improvements are necessary and important to enhance the future sustainability of accreditation and the future relevance as well. And that was covered with um, cross-sectional study. Now, in, in our thesis, the first study in chapter two was to assess the impact of hospital accreditation. And in this systematic review, we searched the literature published in the last two decades using all languages, and we end up with a, 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 a comprehensive evaluation ended with including 76 studies. And to summarize the results there, around 55% of the studies were mentioning a positive impact of accreditation in several aspects, management, uh, patient safety culture, uh, uh, efficiency, length of stay, and some other uh, at the same time, we have found a consistently negative effect when it comes to the staff stress level. Some other indicators, uh, such as um, uh, job satisfaction, patient experience, readmission, were found unrelated to the accreditation. So overall, we found around 55% positive impact, that means compliance with accreditation standard, it has a promising benefit. However, we always need to look at accreditation as part complement other healthcare uh, improvement strategies. With this positive impact, you tend to see hospitals easy to comply with this standard. However, in Saudi Arabia, context, we found that more than one third of surveyed hospitals, they couldn't show a satisfaction level. Is it perception related? Is it management related or both? This is tend to go to the second study. And in this study, we try to take the perception of hospital director toward accreditation, as well as how accreditation works, because we believe that if you understand the mechanism of work for accreditation, you will be better in a position to, to judge the effectiveness of this strategy. In this study, we have interviewed uh, 15 hospital directors from different geographical location, covering almost all sectors in, in Saudi Arabia. And the overall perception was positive. They received accreditation positively, and they explained the mechanism of work for the accreditation. Actually, we analyzed the, the working mechanism using the normalization process theory. In their explanation, they said the first step in, uh, in, in adopting or implementing accreditation standard is uh, with uh, a coherence, and coherence here, it more of making sense of accreditation. This making sense of accreditation tend them to go to the second phase of cognitive participation. They tend to have kind of tool to reduce resistance as well as encourage more engagement from individuals and teams in their organization. Once you have this buy-in, they can easily move to a third phase, which is collective actions. And the collective actions we start doing the gap analysis. And based on the gap analysis, we try to take some 
bundle of actions to fulfill these uh, uh, identified performance gaps. Now, once you are done with completing this performance gap, you won't forget to, to do a reflexive monitoring in which you reassess what went wrong and what worked well to complete the residual gap in the performance. Now, the conclusion of the study was that these four steps of implementing accreditation were sequential and interrelated. And also, we found some um, important features addressed by the hospital director concerning some ways of improvement and some challenges interfaced. And in the third phase, which is collective action, some hospital directors, they have discussed some challenges. We were cautious. I mean, to which extent those challenges affect the overall status at the national level. And that was the trigger for the third study, which is presented in chapter four, in evaluating the driving as well as the restraining forces impacting and affecting the accreditation at a wider scale. Interestingly, in this study, we interviewed a 27 hospital director and 29 hospital director. The reason behind, we understand that hospital director are more cautious of external related drivers and enablers, uh, while quality directors, they are more cautious of internal related causes, either enablers or, or challenges. Now, the investigation or the analysis, the thematic analysis of this study revealed that, yeah, there are lots of driving, such as teamwork, quality mindset, continuous accreditation readiness, commitment to patients. On the other hand, there are some restraining forces need not to be forgotten. The major restraining factors identified in this study were insufficient manpower, infrastructural gaps, workforce recruitment challenges, uh, inter-survey reliability, and limited financial support. We understand that those challenges are context-specific. So I'm discussing these challenges in the context of Saudi Arabia. Actually, a stakeholder, policymaker, they can get use of such uh, important information about driving and, and restraining to assess accreditation readiness at organizational level and at, at national level. They can also prioritize efforts required to fulfill some performance gaps. And this will help us institutionalizing accreditation standard. This is a nice slide representing at national level how the uh, interbalancing forces between driver and restrainer. I mean, having a close look at this, and although this is a qualitative study, we added a, a quantitative flavor to the study by asking interviewee to rank the importance or the significance of each of these factors. Actually, looking at this slide, it shows you that there are drivers, but there are much of restrainer. This equilibrium state in the force field analysis, it means moving toward next step will be really hard. There are significant challenges need to be addressed. That means that those challenges, if not addressed, accreditation in the future may go the dinosaur way. So we, we, we cannot stand here without offering solution. We search for solution. In the literature, the literature full of solutions. However, all solutions found hypothetical. And every researcher, uh, they, they recommend some actions. And as you know, when, when everything is important, then nothing is important. We collected all these recommendations. And we end up having a tool piloted, pre-tested, verified, factorially validated, and distributed to all quality directors in accredited hospital in Saudi Arabia, in a cross-sectional study in accredited hospital. Interestingly, the overall findings, it shows that we, at this point, we need to introduce some changes, and changes not only in the standard, changes 
in accreditation policies, in standard development, in evaluation method, as well as the evaluation team. I'd love to mention some of these. Integrating consumer perspective in accreditation was seen as one of the most important, including patients not to be just a recipient of care. They can play a major role in accreditation. Aligning accred accreditation with other lever of the country, also from the perspective of the quality director, it has been perceived with a high importance. When it comes to improvement in, st in standard development, periodic update and shifting from structure to outcome, also seen as an important element, need to be considered. This could, to some extent, explain why some countries, they found challenges in maintaining and sustaining accreditation. For instance, in, Zimb in, in, in Zimbabwe, uh, Uganda, uh, Denmark, accreditation stopped there because the challenges overweigh the driving forces. Also, some improvements in evaluation methods. And here we are talking about uh, emerging artificial intelligence in, in accreditation and substituting the snapshot evaluation by accreditation maintenance. So in summary, changes are important to be introduced in the current accreditation model because in the Saudi Arabia context, accreditation has been viewed as good but at the same time, we are faced with several challenges. This study, it offers the solution. Only to Saudi Arabia? Not really, because accreditation is more than 90 countries, and almost all countries facing similar challenges, and they have the same driving. Then introducing these changes at national and international level will end up with having more robust accreditation system more sustained and relevant to the future. This is one of the implications, yet there are several implications for our study. It goes with some contribution to staff and managers. In this, our dissertation, it shows that leading leadership support and awareness campaign may reduce accreditation related state. This is something important hospital leaders, they need to keep it in, in mind. Engaging front line in normalizing accreditation processes, essential continuous readiness was real driving when it comes to implementation of the standard, contribution to policymaker, Understanding accreditation working mechanism, drivers, restrainers, will help policymakers definitely in harmonizing accreditation with other performance improvement mechanisms. And for the accreditation bodies, accreditors, they need to reframe accreditation model. They need to strengthen the enabler and they need to weaken the restrainer if they really want this to be a quality improvement tool, sustained, and relevant to the future. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I pass the word back to the Prorector. Thank you very much, Mr. Candidate, for a very nice lecture. We will now start your position, and the first opponent is also the chair of the Assessment Committee, and it's Professor Van Meerode. He's Professor in Logistics and Operational Management in Healthcare at the Maastricht University Medical Center. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, as a chairman of the assessment committee, I first want to uh, congratulate you. Uh, we were very positive about your thesis. Because uh, still, this is an exam, so we will challenge you. Uh, Please. Uh, uh, my, my first observation is about uh, Proposition uh, 1. Um, it has much to do why I am interested uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, accreditation systems. Uh, when you try to aggregate, if you have to aggregate uh, in a hospital, I think you have two challenges. One challenge is to, um, to really discover what is going on in the hospital. That's one thing. And the other thing, if you know this, what would be the effect between the factors you find, the facts you find, and, and the outcome? Now, um, in, in, in this proposition one, you are very uh, sure about this. You say uh, compliance with accreditation standards contributes to improving the quality and the safety of healthcare services. This proposition is mainly based on the literature review, I assume. Yes. 
uh, uh, highly esteemed opponent. Um, thank you for, for the uh, nice words and th thank you for your question. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, this proposition basically based on the um, uh, results of the first, uh, the first systematic review. Yeah. Um, uh, looking back in, in this systematic review, we, uh, we, we searched the last two decades and one of the argument in the literature and that's maybe the argument that people usually used when, when they, they are still skeptical about the accreditation impact, is not having a randomized trial proved the effectiveness of accreditation. In that, we are talking about a phenomena and uh, implementing accreditation standard, which is evidence-based standard, actually practically and ethically, it's not easy to conduct a randomized trial in such a way. However, there are lots of observational and longitudinal studies. Yeah. They, they, have, they have shown uh, an impact of accreditation, but the impact wasn't in all aspects. So for example, when it comes to outcome, there, there were consistent evidence of positive impact when it comes to length of stay, while we, we couldn't find a consistent evidence when it comes to mortality. We found a paradoxical effect, and it was good in, in some place and, and not in, in other place. That's why part of our conclusion for this chapter was not at all to view accreditation as a standalone performance improvement. Always it should go parallel with other, uh, with other uh, strategic performance improvement tools. Yeah, yeah, but, okay, thank you. And uh, so, so, the, the, so the overall, it is, is positive, but at the same time, we're a mix, mix, uh, is a mix uh, image, and especially um, uh, staff, um, staff stress is an is an issue, and 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 I propose a theory about this, and I'm uh, I'm asking you to react to this. Huh? Uh, so, um, in organization theory, there is an um, an, 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 an specific theory about um, what is called uh, institutionalism. Institutionalism is, an, uh, is a phenomenon where you see that organizations, they shape their organizational structure, their routines, uh, not primarily because they are effective, but because others do it. Uh, so hospitals copy these other structures. Uh, uh, that's what you, what you see. And, uh, and once it is, uh, the process goes by from one organization to the, to the next, uh, top, the top management takes that structure, and then it is implemented uh, uh, Top, top, uh, top uh, down. The same theory says that um, that because these routines and, sh and organizational forms uh, might not be uh, effective, huh, that at a certain level in the organization, and that may, may be at the watch, huh, there is a kind of uncoupling. Uncoupling means that the that the management of these departments do, if they like their, these structures, but in fact internally they try to work as they always did. Uh, so and this is very inefficient because then you're working two systems. Uh, you 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 try to make an, uh, a window dressing, uh, how nice you do, uh, but at the same time you work as as, as always. Uh, how how does uh, accreditation processes? Because this this is after uh, s chapter two, uh, because there you show how you do accreditation. How do accreditation processes deal with this phenomena? And could this explain? the job, st the, 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 the staff stress. Uh, 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 this theory, I mean, you could also say a hypothesis. Eh? Yeah, uh, uh, highly esteemed point, thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, actually, when it comes to uh, accrediting body, they have taken some measures uh, in order to ensure that compliance with those accreditation standards is, is along the way. That's why we can, we can find uh, several accreditation bodies. They have created them a maintenance accreditation maintenance policy to ensure that uh, even if the staff, they tend to implement those standard uh, in, in, with, with shortened time, which add more stress, and we end up having, and they end up having kind of shortcuts. They, they, they still, uh, uh, up, I mean, subject to have submit some maintenance requirement. So for instance, in, in the Saudi context, 
the evaluation is still a snapshot evaluation. But this is snapshot evaluation, which will be followed by accreditation decision, either to grant it or not. But once an accreditation is granted, this decision will be followed by submitting several requirements and may end up also with having some unannounced visit in order to ensure that hospitals are in regular compliance and, and the staff stress level or the, the, the short of time prior to accreditation wasn't effective. This is from the uh, perspective of the uh, accreditor. From the hospital side, hospitals, they have a big chunk. Actually, the conclusion of the second study was that making sense of accreditation is a step number one. And making sense of accreditation, it, it comes with with awareness campaigns, it comes with familiarization with the standard, it comes with having these standards into... Yeah, I agree with this, uh, but you can imagine that, uh, that that hospitals have two goals with uh, being accredited, to be accredited, uh, so that's, uh, uh, and, but also to learn. Uh, and, and what you are emphasizing is the learning aspect. Uh, but uh, even if you want to learn, still it is not nice to have a negative score. So, uh, avoiding a negative uh, sc score is something that hospitals uh, are prepared to have. I, I know several hospitals who uh, take a lot of energy, uh, put a lot of energy in just to make sure that they have a good mark, apart from the learning process. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, we, we, we do agree with you. Yeah. And because uh, uh, sometimes the hospital, especially in the countries where the accreditation is mandatory, they are, they are really under challenge of implementing a good standard, but at the same time, they want to comply with the regulatory requirement. Yet, when we look at the, at the bigger picture of having an impact, even if the staff, they implement these uh, standards under, under uh, stress or under obligation, if we look at the outcome from, from a bigger angle, uh, we can still find some positive impact because at the end of the day, we are talking about implementing an evidence-based, predefined uh, standard. So it's, it's a win-win situation, even if it's mandatory and, and the hospitals, they, they go with uh, implementing these accreditation standards to be accredited. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I give the word back to the rector. Thank you, Professor Meerode, for your position. Then we come to the second opponent, who's also a member of the assessment committee, and that is Professor Abdul Momen. He's professor and consultant in anesthesia and critical care medicine in the uh, medical college in the King Saud University in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. And thank you, uh, Professor Abdul Momen, for coming here, albeit online, because the University of Maastricht is always very glad to have guests from abroad. The floor is yours. Chairman, for reminding me, and, uh, and uh, uh, congratulations to Mr. Hussein for uh, his efforts in writing and uh, explaining his thesis to, to the board members. Uh, Mr. Hussein, I'm, uh, I'm, I will have uh, two questions. Since I'm from Saudi Arabia, I will, uh, and I myself, I had uh, many uh, challenges of accreditation process during my uh my time so uh, how how do you think uh, what do you think how the the accredited process or the accredited body will overcome the bias of um the hospital uh, will uh, fix the kbi or fix the 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 standards versus the actual actual numbers in the uh, in, health, in, in the health services. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your uh, question. This was uh, still and uh, I think will be a challenge uh, of ensuring the credibility of performance data. That's why in, in chapter five in our dissertation, one of the most important perceived uh, changes and improvement in the current accreditation model is to move from just a snapshot evaluation into a continuous performance trigger evaluation in which those accredited healthcare facilities or hospitals, they tend to submit those numbers on regular basis. 
also as part of the maintenance for this accreditation process, having a periodic re-evaluation for the performance is a key. That's why we found um, a huge movement nowadays in the accreditation evaluation techniques from being just document-based into the implementation side. That's why we found in the accreditation process the move to go from document review into observation and interviewing uh, the staff to ensure that the process or the standard are implemented along the way. So accreditation bodies, they, yes, they do have a role here in maintaining a robust accreditation maintenance policy, as well as introduce some improvement in the surveyors as well. Because when it comes to surveyors, continuous training, a proper selection was also uh, recognized as an important change is need always to be uh, considered uh, in order to give the, 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 uh, the capacity and the skills for the survey team to evaluate and depict such uh, performance improvement data. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my second question will be, uh, what do you think, uh, Mr. Hussein, what do you think, uh, uh, since, you, uh, since there, there, there are uh, a questionnaire for, for the hospital directors, what do you think of the perception uh, of, the, of the local accredited body versus the international accredited body? What do, how do you think? What what are the major differences and and the different and the perception to uh, from the directors of the hospital uh, in their side? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, national versus international, both carrying some uh, 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 pros and cons. In, in the Saudi context, accreditation was starting by adopting some international uh, accreditation programs, uh, such as Joint Commission in the United States. Yet, in 2005, the National Accreditation Program has been launched, which had been mandated thereafter. One of the advantages of the national you can, uh, uh, one, of the one of the advantages of the National Accreditation Program, that you can empower other health policy in the country, as well as you can integrate your standard and align it with the requirement of other, um, uh, with other health policies. What we have seen that some international accreditation standard sometimes contradict with the national requirement in which the staff there will be skeptical between adopting and rejecting such accreditation standard. This can be easily overcome when it comes to the accreditation, the national accreditation. As well, the standard itself, also case sensitive. When you, when you develop your own national accreditation program, you can analyze the data at the country level, the major event happening in the country, and you can add and emphasize more on this standard in your national uh, accreditation. And here I can give an example. In the national accreditation standards in Saudi Arabia, a lot of emphasis have been given on medical gas safety, which usually maybe you don't see it in the international accreditation. The reason behind that standards were developed based on national data, based on events, real events happen in the data. This another advantage for the uh, um, national over international. Either way, as I said, national and international, it has some advantages as well as uh, disadvantages. I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Professor Abdul Momen, for your opposition. Then the following opponent is also a member of the assessment committee, that's Professor Van Houdenhoven. He's Professor in Economic Management in Healthcare and Chair of the Board of Directors at the St. Martin's Clinic at the Radboud University and part of the School of Management. And thank you for coming all the way from Nijmegen again uh, online, but you're more than welcome in Maastricht. Professor Vaderhoff. Thank you, Mr.
Personal note, though, in your thesis, you have researched hospital directors and their attitude towards and their role in accreditation. And I'm one of those directors, but in the Netherlands and not in Saudi Arabia. And in your thesis, there is mention of the stress for the frontline staff of hospital because of accreditation. But out of personal experience as a hospital CEO, I can tell you by heart, there's also stress for a hospital CEO during the accreditation and especially at the end of the accreditation. But besides this, I have some questions. And the first one is uh, quality and safety and performance assessment is a daily task of the leadership and of all the frontline staff and management of a hospital. And I've done several accreditations. A hospital should be a learning organization. My hospital and several others have changed over the years from one kind of accreditation, uh, for instance, from ISO to QualiCore, from QualiCore to JCI. And what can be seen over the years is that some kind of learning in getting the accreditation, learning to pass the exam, not improving, but just passing for the sake of the accreditation. So changing from QualiCore to JCI has put some real stress to my hospital two years ago, but also created a new way of looking at quality improvement. So it helped me to improve to the next level of quality in my hospital. And can you elaborate on this practical experience from the learnings in your research? Am I, as a hospital CEO, doing the right thing by changing from one accreditation system to another? Or is it just a cosmetic change? And what would you advise to the policy leaders in Saudi Arabia on this subject? Please. Hi, Listin Popon, and thank you for your uh, uh, words and thank you for your question. Uh, the study in Chapter 3, yes, as you, you mentioned, it, it highlights the, the stress at uh, frontline level. Yeah, we understand and from my experience in the field, I, from this, the research we have done, I can definitely look at uh, accreditation preparation. Uh, uh, we have always two types of accreditation preparation, just-in-time preparation or continuous readiness. Lacking the continuous readiness model implementation is one of the factors that shouldn't be forgotten as a leading cause of this stress. We have seen hospitals sleeping the whole way and they just wake up to prepare for accreditation just a few months before the accreditation, which end up with sending uh, a flush of emails and uh, that's, that definitely will add more stress uh, to the staff. The hospital with a mentality of continuous readiness, definitely they will step by step have and an incorporation for these standards in daily business operation. Not only before accreditation, even the impact it goes after accreditation, just in time accreditation preparation end up with having a sharp decline in the performance post the survey, while as you thankfully mentioned, uh, continuous performance improvement and continuous readiness model over time will make an improvement and will sustain the performance gain after the visit. I'm not saying it won't drop, but even if it drops, it will drop with some remaining performance gain. Now, uh, uh, definitely this kind of, of change and it's associated with introducing such change. I cannot argue the, 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 the importance of accreditation, but definitely I cannot say one accreditation different than other because in my thesis, I'm saying there are lots of variation between accreditation worldwide. And this drastic variation may be also participate in uh, limiting the conclusion that could be drawn on the accreditation uh, impact. So uh, the change, by the way, sometimes it could be cosmetic, but sometimes it could be needed if you feel that the accreditation body uh, you, ha you are selecting, is, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help or, or it doesn't have a, a real impact on your uh, process, especially when we are talking about a voluntary accreditation process. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a second question, Mr. Chairman? Certainly. 
is it uh, is it possible for you, dear candidate, that one of your parents can read out loud proposition number five for me? And the Accreditation is not a target or certificate attained and hung on a wall. It is a quality marker and performance improvement journey. Thank you very much. And, and the question is, if the hospital CEOs in Saudi Arabia agree with your proposition number five and see it as an improvement journey uh, and therefore as a part of their job, do you then advise the government of Saudi Arabia to stop linking the accreditation to the reimbursement system or not? And, and if so, can you elaborate on that? Uh, a highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, in, in the sample we have taken in study number two and in, presented in chapter three, uh, the hospital interviewed hospital director, they perceived accreditation as real improvement. And as, as written in, in the chapter, they have perceived accreditation as something added uh, uh, with, with a good impact, even, and some of them, they mentioned that even if it's not mandatory, we will still opt to go and select uh, accreditation. Now, uh, and on the other hand, we need to acknowledge that uh, the health system in Saudi Arabia, it's uh, public and private. And in that, we are talking about around 25%, 100, more than 140 hospitals uh, private. And uh, uh, those private hospitals, the, the payment mechanism, it includes accreditation as part of. So the payment mechanism for those organization is still uh, uh, we have the accreditation uh, because accreditation has been believed as an external evaluation in which you have an uh, independent entity come and visit and evaluate the performance in this hospital. So up until today, accreditation is used as a reimbursement model with other, definitely with, with other uh, uh, tools. Now, yeah, they perceived it as, as an improvement and at the same time, it's used for their uh, reimbursement. So implementing accreditation, as we said, it's a win-win situation to comply with the regulation, to fulfill the compensation related, as well as to have kind of, uh, uh, let's say, trust with the system you are providing when it comes to maternal hospital. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, is it possible the last small question or is there no yeah, time anymore? Very, very short question and a very short answer. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. In your research, you spoke about variations among survey teams. And on page 202 in the part about a contribution relevant to accreditators, you said accreditators need to uh, extort efforts in using rigorous selection criteria for recruiting surveyors. Can you give me some criteria? And do you think it's wise that acting hospital CEOs can be a surveyor in an accreditation of an other hospital? And do they meet your criteria? Uh, uh, dear simple opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, to, to, to address the question, uh, yeah. The last chapter in the, or chapter number uh, five, this is this important point and suggested five uh, uh, improvements can be taken to improve or to reduce the inter-surveyor uh, variability. Actually, one of those are the selection criteria, because if you don't have a selection criteria, uh, you won't be able to send someone able to evaluate other areas. And here, the selection criteria could be experience related, qualification related. It depends on the standard you are uh, proposing. So for instance, um, uh, having, um, uh, having non-physician evaluating the physician related performance that, that could end up with having improper assessment. That's why uh, selection criteria should be based solely on your standards. In Saudi context, the standards are mixed, some facility related, laboratory related. That's why the survey team consists of seven surveyors and those seven surveyors are each of them specialized in their 
uh, areas, and they evaluate the standard relevant to their scope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your position, Professor van Houdenhoven. Now we have the following opponent, also a member of the assessment committee, and that is Professor Scherbier. He is Professor in Quality Improvement of Education at the University of Maastricht. Professor Scherbier. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, I really enjoyed reading your thesis about such an important topic. Also because I was able to visit Saudi Arabia several times and enjoyed your interesting and nice country. So first of all, my compliments for you and the team. Um, very good studies and four papers. Accreditation is for many people a difficult topic and it takes a lot of time and effort as you clearly describe in chapter four. In chapter three, you explore the opinion of hospital directors. You also describe the difference between leaders and the frontline workers. My question is, do you think that frontline workers sh should be more involved in the process of accreditation? And do you have ideas how to realize that? I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, I didn't get the, the question. Okay, good, no problem. So my question is, do you think that frontline workers, because you make a difference in directors and frontline workers in the thesis, so my question is, how could we involve these frontline workers more in the accreditation process? Yeah. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, accreditation impact, it goes with several levels, at organizational level, uh, at micro and macro level, to cut short. So uh, there are some differences, we have seen it in, in even uh, chapter four, when it comes to driving, forces and challenging. Uh, uh, directors level, they, they used to focus more on the external related uh, factors, either driving or, or restraining. Yeah. While the frontline staff, they, they used to focus more on the internal challenges or internal driving system related and process related. Now, to address these, we, we cannot just overcome internal challenges and forget about external challenges. So either the, 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 the challenges reported by directors or frontliner both should be addressed. It's important to note that the working mechanism of accreditation as seen in, in chapter three, mm -hmm. it works with involving those frontline staff. So directors, they need to include uh, those frontline staff in order to have kind of pioneering engagement in the process. If the director fail to do so, that will make a prolonged time when it comes to step number three, which is the action that should be taken. So definitely including them is, is, uh, is really important. Okay. okay. Then I go further on the question of my colleague Van Houdenhoven, because in the Netherlands we see that, that um, people from different hospitals, also CEOs, uh, work at accreditation in other hospitals. Do you think that is a good idea? Uh, there is, as, as long as there are rules and, and uh, these rules are followed and respected, considering the uh, ethical related issues and conflict of interest, then definitely the one who's better to evaluate hospital is someone working in a hospital. So definitely, uh, as long as there is no conflict of interest and this surveyor or evaluator or assessor has the capacity and the skills to evaluate other hospitals, then definitely they can be here and there. Because uh, at the end of the day, we are talking about healthcare professional. Having a large number of healthcare professional, they just do evaluation and they will be away from their clinical practice for some time, even if they are good now, with time, they will lose the track and they won't be able to keep abreast with the evidence based. So yes, definitely, you can still use the surveyor from uh, one hospital to other hospital. If they meet your selection criteria, I yeah. think. Yeah, okay. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. Then from your CV, I learned that you have a lot of experience yourself, 18 years and you trained around 12,000 healthcare workers, so very experienced experienced person. Now your exam is almost finished, not ready yet, but almost. 
it's nice to think about the future. And could you imagine that you have the money to do more studies? Imagine. Um, I'm not promising anything. Imagine. <laughs> Uh, and then my question is, what kind of topics with an accreditation would you choose for further studies? I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but just before we start the session here, I have submitted uh, a request, uh, I mean application for, for another uh, PhD here in, in Maastricht. And already, already I, have, I have listed there uh, five studies, more in medical education. Okay. So I have already submitted the proposal for five studies, two quantitative, two qualitative, and one systematic review to understand why physician, nurses, pharmacists, all healthcare provider, when they move from the school, they don't implement what they have learned. They, although quality and patient safety is an integral part of most of the curriculum, mm -hmm. when, when they start their practicing, uh, they don't move what they have learned into practice. So yeah, that's, that's in mind and that's already done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. I give it back to the pro -hector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Scherbier, for your position. And then we come to the following uh, opponent, who is also a member of the assessment committee, that's Professor Chabanovska. She's professor in public health leadership and workforce development at the University of Maastricht. And today she has also accepted the role of secretary of this committee, for which I'm very grateful. Thank the floor you is yours. Much. Thank you very much, uh, dear candidate. I would like to say that I read your thesis with pleasure. Uh, it's very well structured and provides a lot of useful information for accreditation. And congratulations to your supervisor for producing this uh, piece of work. I have two questions for you. The first one relates to methods. Uh, in chapter two, uh, you are using thematic analysis to analyze the qualitative data. Uh, while you are using thematic analysis, at the same time, I noticed that you use normalization process theory a priori to um, group the themes under the theoretical constructs of the theory. And it looks like directed content analysis. And I would like to ask, what is the rationale that you use this deductive way of thinking? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Um, we used thematic analysis, although uh, when we start drafting the, the, the uh, questionnaire guide, we were inspired by several theories. I mean, as part, of, as part of the study, as part of the literature review, we were inspired by several theories. So uh, we were not sure at that point which theory could explain the findings. Yet, um, probably our, uh, uh, our inspiration with those different models leads us to write some questions. It can be addressed and, and fits all at once. Once we start, um, once we start the, the thematic analysis, we start asking at that time that which theory of what we have reviewed fits, fits more to explain uh, the results. So uh, what I was trying to say is I wasn't trying to prove one of these theory. Rather, I was trying just to find one of the theory to explain the thematic analysis results in a streamlined way Readers can understand it, and it can explain the, the, the movement of the, uh, or the steps of, of the study results. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'll move to the second question. Please. And uh, I read your research as the change leadership project. And uh, you have provided all information that can be used to introduce change concerning accreditation. But I miss this final element. We know what uh, future studies can look like, what the recommendations are. But if you, if you would ask a question, how can Saudi Arabian hospital leaders implement accreditation standards to be sustainable, what would you say? Uh, a highly esteemed opponent. <laughs> highly esteemed opponent, thank you for, for your question. Uh, this question is, is really important. With the current challenges found and the equilibrium state of, 
of uh, uh, balancing counter uh, forces found in, in chapter number four, then implementing these changes or implementing some changes at this point is, is definitely important. Now, if I would suggest something, I would suggest them just to read chapter five, because it's basically uh, chapter five in this <laughs> dissertation is based solely on a feedback taken from almost more than 150 quality director diving in the process in their day-to-day -day activity. And they suggest and they have perceived such changes with high importance. So if you ask about the first step, I would recommend that accreditation body, they go one step back. Uh, I won't say start from the scratch, no, but they need to write a new standard considering all these factors, focusing on outcome. I mean, we are in outcome era. Uh, uh, look, look at the current literature talking about value-based healthcare and, and imagine up until today, we have, I, I, I wouldn't say no countries, because maybe there, there are two or three, considering the results of patient reported outcome measures and patient reported experience measures as part of their accreditation process. That means there is one corner forgotten there. My recommendation is uh, there are changes need to be taken at policy level in order not to have an overlap between policies at uh, uh, assessment level Avoid having a snapshot evaluation and focus on continuous monitoring for the hospitals. Don't visit them and come back in three years. That definitely the performance with no continuous monitoring, uh, you, you have no uh, clue what, what could happen. I mean, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't oversee the process there. So uh, again, uh, some suggestion also, it goes with the writing the standard itself some recommendation to go with environmental friendly uh, standards. Having the standards updated more frequently, we are nowadays experiencing changes uh, every now and then. So what's, what's relevant today is really not next year. You don't need to wait five, six, seven years until you uh, go back and update your manual. And not to forget also your evaluator, I'm sorry, your evaluator, your assessor, uh, also, making improvement there to ensure there is no interrelated or inter surveyor variability, this will enhance the public trust and the organization trust with your standards and your evaluation results. So, uh, the evaluation surveyor also should not be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, can I ask one more question? Uh, all right, so although your study relates to Saudi Arabia and uh, the context of hospitals accreditation there, what are the elements from your study that you would say can apply to other contexts? Thank you very much for uh, uh, highly, highly esteemed upon and thank you very much for your question. We have taken Saudi Arabia as a case study. If, if I make a quick comparison between the system in Saudi Arabia and Netherlands, for instance, it's highly similar. I mean, uh, uh, the standards are accredited from ISQA, the organization are accredited from ISQA, they use almost the same framework with some variation and differences, definitely. Now, the challenges experienced, almost similar. Uh, the challenges in, in, in Saudi Arabia have been reported in several literature in in, in high income countries and low income countries. So my, my point here, as long as we're talking about the same challenges, it, it doesn't make sense to continue working in silos. We are talking about the same, uh, uh, the same solutions. It can be definitely transferred from one system to another. So for instance, the results found in chapter uh, three, it can be easily found where else? Because those are hospital director and their view was similar to hospital director where else? Lessons learned from the working mechanism there, it's definitely similar to what you find in Brazil, for instance. Finding in, in chapter number four and those driving and restraining, although I'm still insist that it's, it's context sensitive, but definitely you will have lots of similarities. We understand and believe that 
the, the conclusion or the, the, the discussion chapter with the recommended solution in chapter five are highly implemented uh, across almost all accreditation bodies. Because uh, we have seen, we have reviewed in, in our uh, chapter, in chapter two, we have reviewed 18,000 plus paper. And we have seen that the challenge is almost similar. And I, I understand that ESQA, which is the body accrediting accreditation body, they are trying now to, to streamline and standardize the accreditation uh, across the world. But until this happens, definitely there are lessons much to be learned from here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for your position, uh, Professor Chabanovska. Then I come back to To Professor Van Meerrode. Thank you very much. I, I have a question, or maybe an advice. Um, uh, there are some voices in the Netherlands who say that we should not only uh, accredit uh, organizations or hospitals, uh, but we should also accredit uh, the members of the board and maybe also other management. That's, for example, you could do that every five years, uh, so uh, to be accredited as, an, uh, as, a, as, as being able to be a member of a board. Or you could think about the French system where there's a whole list of functions, management functions in the hospital, and you have to do an exam uh, to, to be admitted to such a position. What are your thoughts about this? And how would you um, connect this with the accreditation system for the organization itself? A, a highly simple point. Thank, thank you very much for your question. Um, we're talking about the board, and here, uh, we go, we go a step back to, to ask what were the selection criteria for those board members. And uh, the you may finish your question or you may say enough is enough. Oh, yeah, yeah no I, can, I, can, I can answer the question. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, sh uh, shortly, uh, those members, usually they, they are taking a strategic decision when it comes to accreditation. Selecting them is important. Continue evaluating them. If you have written a robust criteria for evaluating them, will definitely add value to the accreditation journey. I hope this short answer could. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vermeer Rode, for your position, and Mr. Mohamed uh, Hussein. The time appointed for the defense of your thesis has passed, and the decree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and of your defense. And I request that you and your company here, and also online, await the results of our deliberation and our return in this room. And I suspend the meeting. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Take the mileage,
the future, then we go, 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 go. And even though these nights seem long, I know that I am never on my own. Know you won the battle once you Outside. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and not. Long road to the south side. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and
Spanish is Spanish. Spanish. Hey. I reopen this uh, academic session. Mr. Mohamed Hussein, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the way you defended it. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to, to grant you the degree of doctor and Professor Groot is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Mohammed Hussein, the degree of doctor and grant you all the rights attached to it by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Hussein, dear Mohammed, it gives me great pleasure to be the first to congratulate you with your PhD. I also do this on behalf of Milena. You have written an excellent dissertation, and I speak for both Milena and myself when I say that you've done a fine job today in defending your dissertation as well. Your dissertation makes an important contribution to our knowledge and insight on hospital accreditation in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. Your work not only makes a significant contribution uh, to, to science on this topic, but also provides practical recommendations to improve the effectiveness of accreditation process. On a more personal note, both Milena and me have found it a great pleasure uh, to work with you and to supervise you doing your PhD research. Um, and it's also a pleasure to know that you uh, informed us during the de defense that you plan to do a second uh, PhD degree, uh, 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 probably and hopefully also because of the nice collaboration that you had with us uh, that makes to, to do more of that uh, in, the, in the future. The shine of your dissertation and your defense today also reflects a bit upon, upon us as supervisors. I say this with a reason. Frequently, our hand, that is the hands of Milena and myself, and the input we had in the topic and the writing of the dissertation is clearly visible for those who see. But not in your case. The aims, design, and content of your dissertation are clearly yours. Um, I, can, I, I think I can best describe our role as fellow travelers uh, in your PhD journey. In this journey, you were at the driver's seat and we sat in the back. We advised and encouraged you, sometimes said what, what we thought was the best road to take, but in the end, you decided in what direction uh, you went. Oh, and, this, uh, and it has resulted in an excellent dissertation and a fine number of publications. But not only that, as one of the members of the assessment committee also told me, the dissertation is also a pleasure to read. It's clearly written and in a to-the-point style where each chapter also logically follows from the previous one. 
Your research has already been shown to be important and impactful. Your first, the first study you wrote, a systematic literature review on the impact of hospital accreditation on quality, has already been cited 46 times in less than two years after being published. Three of the papers in your dissertation have already been published in highly respected academic journals, and we expect that these and other pay, the other paper that uh, will be published soon will receive similar amounts of attention within the academic field and in practice. One of the interesting insights your dissertation offers is that physicians, nurses, managers, and other hospital workers have to be engaged in the accreditation in order to integrate the accreditation standards and recommendations, but that on the other side, they have to also have to be disengaged from the accreditation process itself. This tension carries the risk that accreditation loses support and that hospital workers develop resistance against it. This separation also has the risk that the accreditation pro process becomes less relevant and disengaged from the general hospital development or healthcare development in general. Uh, for example, uh, it, that the development towards more patient-centered and value-based care uh, 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 that, that is uh, one of the aims of the uh, healthcare system and the hospital system in Saudi Arabia. In a number of studies, you clearly document this and provide recommendations to ensure that accreditation remains relevant and useful. You first approached the Research Institute Capri in 2017, um, but you started more seriously, I uh, saw, so in August 2019, when you sent a research proposal to uh, Capri. The bureaucracy in Capri apparently works very slow, as it was only three months later, in November, that the Institute approached Milena and me, whether we were interested in being your supervisors. Um, I saw that in your application letter, you named eight potential supervisors uh, at Maastricht University, and it surely was our lucky day that out of these eight, you eventually uh, choose uh, Milena and me to become your supervisor. It also shows how hard and quickly you have worked. Um, you finished writing your dissertation a little over three years after we first met. This is an accomplishment that even PhD candidates who work on the dissertation full time uh, are usually not able to uh, achieve. One of the most significant decisions in life is the choice of career. That was the first sentence in your motivation letter uh, that you sent to the Research Institute for your application. We are very happy that your life choices brought you to us. Since our first online meeting, we have met online and occasionally on, on occasions when you have visited Maastricht also in person about once every three to four weeks. It was always a pleasure to discuss the progress of the work with you. Your cheerful can-do attitude inspired us as well and made that our most significant contribution mostly was to express how happy and satisfied we were with the progress that you have made in the past weeks. Finally, let me again congratulate you, Dr. Hussein, with your excellent achievement, also on behalf of Milena. We also hope to see you back here in the aula uh, soon. Your wife, uh, Ravia, who is attending this ceremony online through the live stream, is also writing her dissertation. And like yours, her dissertation promises to become an excellent addition to science, in her case, on the knowledge and insight on value-based healthcare. We hope and expect to see you, her and, and, and you uh, for, for her defense next year, and perhaps also for your next uh, PhD defense that you will take yourself. I also want to take the opportunity to thank the members of the assessment uh, committee um, uh, for their efforts and work in evaluating your thesis uh, and improve in, in, in providing opposition here today. I also want to extend our congratulations to your wife and your children and to everyone else here present here today and to everyone who has taken the time to watch the live stream and virtually celebrate this joyful event with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Groot, for a nice laudation. Dr. Hussein, also on behalf of the Maastricht University and the deans, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. And of course, I congratulate your parents as well and your family and friends and those here present and those online, but also uh, your supervisors, Professor Groot, Professor Pavlova, 
with this uh, great day. And uh, I thank uh, the members of the opposition for the work, and of course, Luke Peters, Joshua van Verdu, and the Pedel and their team, uh, because they made this uh, hybrid session possible. Having said that, I'm almost uh, closing this meeting. I have a few announcements to make. Um, we would like the photograph to stay here. The ladies can already go to the uh, rafter where the uh, reception will be. Then we're going to make a picture here, a photo with the two uh, professors online, and then we will make a picture at the foot of the stairs as well. So we have some work to do, and then we we'll go to the reception and uh, get together. Thank you very much. Having said Thank it all, I close this meeting. Thank you.